I'd like to share some thoughts this evening from the book of Ruth. So I'm sure you all have the Bible with you, um, especially since you're at home, you can't forget it. And we're going to read a couple of verses from each chapter. And I just want to go through it and pick out some things that uh, I have personally enjoyed. Most likely they are things that you already know. And if that's so, that's great. It is a very precious book, a very lovely book, very easy to read. Perhaps one of the most loved books in the Old Testament, a book that we find no, nobody that's mean. We don't really find anything that's difficult to understand in the book. Uh, so I say it's a very precious book. So let's read Ruth chapter 1 and verse number 1. And it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled, or the really the idea is the judges judged, that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Malon and Kilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. And Malon and Kilion died also both of them. And the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. And she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might come, sorry, that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. And we'll flip over to chapter number two, verse number one. And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabitess said unto Naomi, Let me go now to the field and glean ears of corn after him in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. Verse 3 is one of my favorite verses. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. Chapter 3, verse 1. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said unto her, My daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee, that it may be well with thee? And thou is not Boaz of our kindred, with whose maidens thou wast. Behold, he winnoweth barley tonight in the threshing floor. Chapter 4, verse 1. Then went Boaz up to the gate and sat down, set him down there, and behold, the kinsman of whom Boaz spake came by, unto whom he said, Ho, such a one. I, I like that one better in Spanish because it says Fulano for those that speak some Spanish. Ho, such an one. Turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit ye down here. And they sat down. And we'll go towards the end of the book. Uh, verse number 13, so Boaz took Ruth, and she was his wife, and when he went in unto her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. And the women said unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. And he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life, and a nourisher of thine old age. For thy daughter-in-law, which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons, hath borne him. And Naomi took the child and laid it in her bosom and became nurse unto it. And the, woman, her, and the women, her neighbors, gave it a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi. And they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now, I have this horrible habit, which I probably have done in Monrovia as well, of starting towards the end of my message, because I fear sometimes I won't get to the end of my message. But I just want to notice a couple of things here in chapter number four, how the book is actually going to finish. Number one, the only time we find love mentioned in this book is here in chapter number four. And it's not the love between Boaz and Ruth, because sometimes we think it's a love story. And it is a love story. But the love that we find, the only love that we find mentioned, I'm not saying it's the only love, but the only love we find mentioned is the love between a mother-in-law and her daughter-in-law. Now, that is rather interesting. That is rather practical in itself. Now, I have no problems with my mother-in-law whatsoever. I know some people who do. The other thing that I noticed here is this at the end of the book is that it says that there is a son born to Naomi. Well, it really wasn't 
he really wasn't born to Naomi. He was born to Ruth. And yet he was going to take the place of the sons that she had lost. I wonder how Ruth felt about this when she heard it. Perhaps she felt absolutely fine. She was, as it were, almost a surrogate mother so that Naomi could have uh, a son. And also Bo Boaz was going to give her the inheritance because for the Jewish people, the inheritance was of a great importance. So leaving chapter number four, uh, I just want to make some comments about the book in general, about some things that I have noticed, some things that I have enjoyed. Uh, and the first thing that I mentioned already is the fact that it is a precious book. Number two, I shouldn't really number these, but I'm not going to tell you how many numbers I have. We'll just keep on going through it and see how far we get. Number two, the period. This was likely the 12th century before Christ. But more important than that is it says this, in the days when the judges judged or when the judges ruled. So that takes us obviously back to the previous book and we think to ourselves, what was the time like when the judges ruled? Uh, it was, we would say almost a vicious cycle. And the cycle was kind of like this, idolatry, discipline, a plea to God, and then a judge that was provided. And that was repeated over and over and over again. The people fell into idolatry or into some sin similar. And then God sent discipline by the means of a, a different nation from time to time. They eventually came to their census. They would make a plea to God. And then God would send a judge to deliver them. Because the judges really were people that delivered them from the hands of the, from the, hands of the enemies. And also, obviously, their responsibility was to, was to judge them. So there was this cycle. It was a time of great chaos because three times in the book of Judges, we read this phrase, there was no king in Israel, no king. Now, that is not really, in my mind, at least it's not really a political statement. It's a theological statement. And I say it for this reason, that what, what God really wanted, God wanted to be their king. Now, we know when we come farther along in 1 Samuel, they ask for a king, and we'll get to that just in a moment or two. But when it says there was no king in Israel, really what they were doing, they were, they were rejecting God himself as their king. So it's not a political statement. It is a theological statement. And it tells us something about the chaos that the nation found itself in at that particular time. So we look at the cycle. We look at the chaos. But think about the confusion. Uh, and I speak about confusion in the sense of uh, when you read through the book of Judges, chapters 1 through 16, we find national departure the nation had departed from god when you look at chapter 17 18 19 20 and 21 we find shall we say religious departure because there we find and i'm not going to take time to look at the stories at all but we find horrific stories that shows us there was religious departure from god at that particular time as well and when we come into ruth chapter number one the first thing that we read really is personal departure from god because this man elimelech is going from a place of blessing because Bethlehem, as we will note, is called the house of bread, or that's what it means. And he is leaving the place where God has said, this is the house of bread, this is where I am providing. And they decide to go all the way over to Moab, about 50 or 60 miles thereabouts. So uh, the period of time, a period of uh, this, these cyclical, um, I was going to say cyclical cycles, but that's obviously redundant, but a period of cycles and chaos and confusion. The third point that I noticed tonight is that the penman, who, who wrote the book? And you will say, well, I don't know. And I will say, I agree, I don't know either. Some have suggested that it was Samuel that wrote the book. It doesn't really matter so much who wrote the book. We know that whoever wrote it, obviously wrote it when David was already perhaps reigning at the very least, because the lineage comes as far as David in chapter four and verse number 17. So. David was already alive, at least. He was most likely reigning by the time it was, it was written. But besides the fact that we don't know who, who he was, I want to think about his ability. Because as you read this book, and now I don't know about you, but um, a few weeks ago, this was part of my daily reading. And so I kind of got stuck in it. I, I am reading through 1 Samuel, but I got stuck in, in the book of Ruth, and I've been reading it over and over and over again. And uh, I actually I started to speak on it here on a Thursday night in Hermosillo as well. Um, so I find it very difficult to read Ruth chapter one and not read Ruth chapter two. And when I get to the end of chapter two, I can't not read chapter number three. And finishing chapter number three, well, you can't just stop there. So he has a tremendous ability in expressing himself in a way that 
grabs our attention and makes us want to keep reading it and reading it and reading it. So that's, that's what we need to do, especially with a short book. It's wonderful to read the whole book. I think I mentioned to you, Ruben mentioned that um, last time I was there, I spoke on the book of Job. I, I didn't read the whole book of Job uh, during the meeting, obviously. Um, but it's easy to even sit down and read the whole book of Job in, in not that terrible amount of time. So read a whole book altogether, and we can easily do that with a book like Ruth. So it's a precious book. We looked at the period of time, and we looked at the penman. But I want to think about problems. Now, I'm looking at people tonight. I can't see all of you at the same time, but I'm looking at people tonight, and I figure that you probably have some problems as well. Some perhaps have health problems. Some perhaps have uh, financial issues because of a lack of, of work, and, and the list could go on and on. Problems are nothing new, as we well know. Um, and here we have, at the very beginning of this lovely book, a problem. What does it say? It says there was a famine in the land. This is almost a, a conundrum in a certain sense, isn't it? Because if Bethlehem means the house of bread, it seems rather odd to say there's a famine in the land. The house of bread has a famine. I don't think it was just the city or the town of Bethlehem, Judah, that had the famine. It was in the whole land of, of Canaan, which was the promised land. And even that, a land which ought to have milk and honey, as it were, that was the promise. And now all of a sudden there was famine. Well, why was there famine? Well, obviously when we look at the book of Judges, we can kind of fit this book of Ruth into the book of Judges and see that God was calling the attention of his people. He was asking them to think. He was causing them to think about their circumstances and, and the why of, of the reason why they were going through these difficulties, why there were these problems. And so problems in the life sometimes is due to something that we have done, but sometimes it's not. Oftentimes it's not. So when we are in a trial, we ought not to think automatically, well, what have I done? What we ought to think about in a trial is, number one, what is God trying to teach me? And number two, what should I do in the midst of this trial? Now, there are, there are two key men in this book, and they had totally different reactions in the trial. Elimelech, he packed up his belongings and he took off. Boaz stuck with the stuff, if I can use that phrase. Boaz, now you will say when you get to chapter number two and chapter three, he was obviously a wealthy man, but Elimelech possibly could have gone to Boaz and looked for some help. You know, that's just a possibility, it's just a suggestion. But the reaction of the two men shows us something about their character. The other thing that shows us something about their character is, is the name that Elimelech gives to his two sons, but we'll get to that just in a moment or two. So one problem is uh, a dearth, D-E-A-R-T-H. There's a lack of food. There's a famine in the land. And God wanted the people to trust in him, the same as today. And the other thing that we find, verses 3 and verses 5 have the same word, but it's not a very nice word. It's the word died. So first of all, Elimelech died, her husband. And then it says in verse number 5 that her two sons died. So we have not just a dearth, a lack of food, a famine, but we have death as well. So I read occasionally, I, at the beginning of all this, I have to say that I was reading far too much news um, about all that was happening with coronavirus up in the United States of America and somewhat in Canada as well. Uh, and very little is happening here in Mexico up to this particular point. We're weeks and weeks behind you folks, it would appear. But um, I was reading far too much news. And you just read about death and birth and problems, and, and it begins to get a bit on the depressing side, to be honest, and it cons almost consumes you. Well, here's a lady who's living in the midst of all of this, and what does it say in verse number five? The woman was left of her two sons and her husband. This, the word that comes to mind here is the word bereft or the word desperation. She's completely desperate. She, she has no land. She has no husband. She has no sons. She has nothing. Absolutely nothing. She is in desperate condition. So a dearth, a death, desperation, and no descendants. Things are not going very well. But I, I'm not trying to go through the book chronologically th this evening at this particular point at least. So th those are the problems, and you can think about your own problems. But the big question is, number one, is God trying to teach me something in the midst of my problems? And generally speaking, he is. And number two, what is going to be my reaction in the problem? Am I going to trust in him more? Am I going to learn to lean upon him more? Or is my reaction going to be more like Elimelech 
and just take off. The next point that I want to look at tonight is the primary words. Now, you, you could perhaps come up with a better list or a longer list, but I'm just going to give you a short list. My short list of important or primary words starts with the word return. Now, it's translated in different ways as we go through uh, the book. But here in chapter number one, we find the word return time and time and time again. And that was a positive thing, obviously. She decided when she heard that there was bread back in the house of bread, when there was food already, she decides to return. That was a, a proper thing. It makes us think about Luke chapter number 15 and the what we call the prodigal son. He understood, here I am dying of hunger, and back in the house of my father, there is plenty of bread. There's bread to spare. And so he arises and he returns to his father. Well, the same thing is happening here in Ruth chapter number one. So a key word is, I think it's 15 times in different ways we find the word return. Interestingly, uh, I think we find it in chapter number four, but it's translated in, the, in, the, in a different way. But it's the restorer of thy life. He is going to return your life to you. It's the very same word. So although it's used in a, in a positive way in chapter number one, in a far more positive way even, we find it in chapter number four. Another word that we find, and you'll pardon my Hebrew because I don't know Hebrew, but the word is hesed, H-E-S-E-D. And it's only three times in the book, which isn't a whole lot. So you might say, well, is that really a primary word? Well, it, it is because although we only find the word mentioned three times in chapter number one, chapter number two, and chapter number three, it's kindly, kindness, and kindness and the three different occasions that we find it in a King James Version. The word means compassion or mercy or goodness or faithful love towards a person for, for whom I am responsible. So we find it in, in Ruth and we find it in Boaz. But really what we find as we read through the whole book is this has said, this kindness, this compassion, this mercy, this faithful love of God towards all of his people. And, and so as you read through the book, just think about the, the kindness of God, how God is working in kindness to fulfill his purposes. Another key word, which is uh, our primary word, if you wish, is the word Bethlehem. And I mentioned already, it means house of bread. Five times we find it here in chapter number one. Two more times we'll find about five times in chapter number one. And so we can think about the fact that we have been truly blessed as believers. Uh, and we are in a place that we could call, in a certain sense, in a spiritual way, perhaps a, a house of bread, a house of plenty. Uh, now, I'm not speaking so much about the physical side of things, but I'm speaking about the spiritual side of things. We have tremendous blessings in the person of Christ. And even in a, a local assembly context, if you allow me to apply it in that way just for a moment or two, in a local assembly context, there is plenty of bread. As we come together, now obviously in a, in a virtual way uh, at this particular time, but as we come together as the people of God, we receive plenty of food, or we ought to be receiving plenty of food. So. They were from a place that was called the house of bread. The other key word, and this really is a primary word, because over 20 times we find the word redeem. Uh, it is translated in different ways. Perhaps, well, I'm saying redeem, redeemer, uh, kinsman, and that type of thing. But over 20 times we find the idea of redeem. So really, this book, we could put a title over it from, from ruin to redemption. Now, there's all kinds of wonderful titles you can put in the book of Ruth. But from ruin to redemption, because that's really what happens in this particular book of Ruth. Point number six, and I shouldn't be counting, and you shouldn't be counting either, but point number six, the providence of God. Now, I, I don't know whether I have spoken on Joseph when I've been in uh, Monrovia or not. If I haven't, sometime I will, because I've enjoyed very much the, the life of Joseph. But the providence of God is the fact that, I, I, think, it was, I think it was Lehman Strauss who explained, uh, or not defined, but described the word providence this way. God is behind the scenes, controlling the scenes he is behind. That's what I think it was Lehman Strauss. If you haven't read any of Lehman Strauss's books, he's got some very good books. Um, but he said, providence, the providence of God means this. God is behind the scenes, controlling the scenes he is behind. So when you read the book of Ruth, you will find the providence of God. It's not a, a word that we'll find, but it is a truth that we will find. So when I think about the providence of God, I just looked as, as you read through the book, you will see the word or the title Lord in capital L-O-R-D 17 times, but seven times in chapter number one. So God is very present. The Lord is very present. 
And this word Lord is the word Jehovah, translated that way in our Spanish Bibles mostly. And it, it means, amongst other things, it means the one who the one who keeps his covenant, the one who keeps his promises. And he is a faithful God that we can depend upon. The other word that we find for him is Elohim in chapter number one and chapter number two. But the one time we find the word El Shaddai, you have to pardon my pronunciation of these words in a language that I don't speak, but in chapter one and verse number 20, he says, she says, the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. So that is uh, an important thing to remember. She understood this. He is the Almighty One. He is the one who is actually in control. So that's why I have used the word providence. Now, in chapter number two and verse number three that we read together already, it says in the middle of the verse, and I said this is probably my favorite verse in the whole in the whole book, although there's wonderful, wonderful verses in the whole book, but one of my favorite verses in the whole book is chapter two, verse number three. When she's gone out to the field and it says, and she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. That was something provided in the in the in the Old Testament. And her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. Her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz. Now, I know that perhaps you're not all reading King James versions, which is absolutely fine with me. Listen to what Darby says. Now, most people aren't going to read Darby, even less so. But Darby says this. She chanced to light on an allotment of Boaz. She chanced to light. Or if you like, the New King James Version or the ESV will say this. She happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz. Happened to. Well, th that's a good way to put it. But, but really what we find there is God was behind the scenes, controlling the scenes he was behind. So it wasn't just a coincidence. She didn't just happen to show up there. God was actually putting her in the right field for his purposes and for his plans. So the providence of God is seen here in chapter number two and verse number three. Uh, we get a different, a different way of putting it, but in chapter number four, it says when Boaz is sitting, is sitting in the gate and he's, he's going to present the opportunity to the other kinsmen, the closer kinsmen, he's going to say, do you want to buy the field? Well, that man just happens to come by. Now, I know it doesn't say happens to come by, but he just happens to come by the gate at that particular time when Boaz is sitting there ready to make this transaction. So God is in control. He, he placed Ruth in the right field, and he placed Boaz at the gate, seated at the gate, right when that so-and-so that, uh, was going to go by at that particular time. My next point, I just want to think about the persons for a moment or two. Besides the genealogy that we find in chapter number four, there are eight people that we find named in this particular book. They are Elimelech. What does Elimelech mean? Most likely, Elimelech, his name means, my God is king. Now, you can ask yourself the question, did he live that way? Or did he actually make a decision that showed that maybe God wasn't his king? Was he moving out of a place where God ought to have been ruling in the land of Israel, and he goes to a place called Moab, which belonged to the enemies of the people of God? So his name was, my God is king, but I don't want to be terribly critical of a person who is long gone, but I asked myself the question, was he actually living as if God was his king? We can ask yourself the same question. When we were, when we were saved, really what we did, we, we were looking last night in Romans chapter number 10 in our Bible study, uh, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth that Jesus is Lord. Well, that's what, that's what really happened when we were saved. So we, we confess that he is our Lord, but the question is, do we live every day as if he is our Lord? He is, but do we live in subjection to him? Then we find his wife, person number two, whose name is Naomi, which means pleasant. Now, we will know that she gave herself another name as she walks back into Bethlehem with a Moabite woman, and she says, my name isn't really Naomi, it's not really pleasant, my name is Mara, or Mara, which means bitterness. Well, that's a sad state of affairs, but that is really what she thought. Now, when, when uh, Elimelech's parents put Elimelech as his name or gave him the name Elimelech, obviously they were people, you would say, of faith. They were saying, my God is king. That was their declaration. But when Elimelech named his children, he didn't put such godly names on them, did he? He called them Malon or Malon, 
and Chilion, however you're supposed to pronounce those two words. Malon y Chilion, they say in Spanish, so that's why I say it wrong for y'all. But the first one means probably, probably means sickly. So can you imagine your child is born, you say sickly. Oh, this is, this is sickly. Well, that's not really probably what we would name our children. And then the next one is Chilean. Now, there, are, there is some debate about these names. I understand that. But this is what is generally accepted. Chilean most likely means pining. So we have sickly and pining. So uh, in, in English, I just don't think that most likely we would call our children sickly and pining. Come over here. Perhaps they were born premature. I really don't know what happened. But uh, for some reason or other, that is what their names happened to be. So what I note from that is this that it is possible that Elimelech was not uh, living as if God was his king. He was not living a life of faith. But then we find that these men are married. And the first one marries Orpah, and the other one marries Ruth. Orpah, that, which means fawn, perhaps, and Ruth, that means beauty. So there they are, uh, sick and piney, married to fawn and beauty. So that's all very, very lovely. Uh, the next name that we find mentioned is Boaz, and that means in him, in God, is strength. So we find Boaz, his, his parents obviously were godly people as well, and they understood that the only strength we have is found in him, is found in God. And, and that is a lesson for us as well. So there are even in these names, there are things that we can learn as we go through it. And then finally, we find the son's name. His name is Obed, which means serving. Now, again, there's a lesson that we can learn from his name that we as believers can serve. Obviously, in a certain sense, our, our sphere of service has changed in these days, at least for the most of us. I, I do tend to stay at home almost all the time, or I try very hard to stay at home because they say here in Mexico, quédate en casa, so I'm staying in my house as much as possible. Uh, but there are believers in need. So I will grab a bag of food or whatever and go drop it off to them and stay six feet away and, and pass it out. with a, This is a pretty strange thing to do with my camera, but I pass it out as, as best as I can. We try to keep the six feet distance. So there are ways that we can serve perhaps that have changed slightly, uh, but we need to understand that we can be like an Obed as well, serving. The next thing that I would like to talk about just for a moment or two is, is the word plenitude or fullness. This book starts with the title of, of uh, Bethlehem, which means house of bread. But really, it starts with famine, hunger. And when there's hunger, what happens to the stomach? It's, it's empty. So we start the book with emptiness. And, and years, years later, many years later, when, when, Ruth retur sorry, when, uh, when Naomi returns to Bethlehem, what does she say in verse number 21? She says, I went out full. The Lord hath brought me home again empty. So she went with something. She understood that she was, she had been in a place of blessing. She went out full, but she came back completely empty. So the book starts with emptiness. But as you continue to read through the book, I just noticed there's a few things that kind of that kind of fill, start to fill Naomi. The first thing is we find in chapter two, verse number 17, that Ruth has gleaned in the field until even she's beaten out what she's gleaned. And it says it was an ephah of barley. Now, how much was an ephah of barley exactly? Some people say 38 liters. Well, that to an American doesn't mean a whole lot, does it? But it means a, it means a lot. There was a lot of barley, okay? So she's being filled. You come to chapter number three and verse number 15, and it talks about six measures of barley. And, and then the message from Boaz that Ruth gave to her mother-in-law was this, go not empty unto thy mother in law. So she had been empty at the beginning and now she's being filled. Now, uh, I'm going to have to return to something else just in a moment or two because I skipped over something I wanted to mention. But anyway, so here we are. Naomi has gone out and she's been looking for a place that would fill her. It didn't fill her, it emptied her when she went all the way to Moab. And now she is being filled bit by bit. Okay. So we come to chapter number four and what happens? Well, what had she lost in the beginning? She lost her husband. She lost her two sons. And now in chapter number four that I said we would try to get back to, and here we are, chapter number four, Naomi, 16, took the child and laid it in her bosom and became nurse unto it. 
So Naomi, who came back and said, I'm coming back with my hands that are completely empty. Now God has placed into my hands this little baby boy. So God had caused her to be emptied, but now God has caused her hands to be full. Now, I am not preaching tonight uh, health and wealth prosperity gospel. I'm not saying that at the end of any particular problem that you're facing today and tomorrow or next month that your hands are going to be filled with so much uh, that you won't know what to do with it. That is, that is not what I'm saying. But I am saying that God is a God of provision. And what she had lost, God is here providing. And he is giving her a child, and she is going to have not only a child, but she is going to have the land as well. And I mentioned that it says in 417 that the women of the, of the neighborhood of the city said this, there is a son born to Naomi. Well, it wasn't hers. I mean, she, she was past childbearing age, it would appear. But nonetheless, she took it as, or she took him as her own. The thing that I, I meant to mention when I was going through the persons was this. When you go through this book, just, just start to count um, and think about why is it called Ruth? Well, you say it's called Ruth because Ruth is the, 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 the hero of the book or the heroine of the book, perhaps is a better word, right? And that, that is perhaps true. But Naomi is actually mentioned, her name was mentioned 19 times. And she's mentioned as mother-in-law, I think, six times. We find Ruth's name just 10 times. And four times she's called the daughter-in-law. Two of those times have to do with her being one of two daughters-in-law. So the book actually mentions Naomi's name a whole lot more than it mentions Ruth's name. However, I'll, I'll leave that aside. Somebody said we could call a book Ruth, Naomi, and Boaz, or Boaz, Ruth, and Naomi, or whatever combination you want to put. But it is called Ruth, and that's a wonderful thing for us to think about. Tonight means it means beauty. So the next point that I want to talk about for a moment or two is the position of the book. Where is this book located in our Bible in English? And I emphasize that for a motive, for a reason. When you read the book of Judges that I mentioned at the beginning, it's a book that talks to us a lot about the rebellion of the people of God. They were rebelling against God. God had clearly told them they had to worship him, and they kept becoming an idolatrous people. So it is a book that is full of, of sin. It's a book that is full of rebellion. But when we come to 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, we find that they are books of, of the reign of Saul and the reign of, of David. So we go from rebellion in Judges to a reign in uh, R-E-I-G-N, not R-A-I-N. Okay, So we go to the reign of Saul and the reign of David in the books of Samuel. So we can ask ourselves the question, how do we, how do we jump or how do we make that jump from rebellion to reign? Well, just let me ask you this question. And, and I, I, I assume I'm speaking to all believers tonight, but perhaps there's somebody here that isn't a believer. So just let me ask you this question. When we look at, when we look at our condition when we were born, we we're actually born as rebellious sinners. Okay? What God wants to do for us, what God wants to do for us is to place us in the kingdom of his beloved son or the son of his love in his reign. So how can we get into the reign or into the kingdom of God? Well, it is through the same thing that we find in the book of Ruth. What do we find in the book of Ruth? I've already mentioned the word. It's the word redemption. So Ruth has been redeemed. Naomi has been redeemed as well, but Ruth has been redeemed. And so we go from rebellion to redemption, and then we have the reign of Saul, the reign of David. Now, not only is there redemption in the book of Ruth, it's not just that Boaz redeems her, but think about the fact that she actually enters into a relationship with her. So there is redemption through Christ, and there is as well a relationship with Christ. Remember what it says in John chapter 17 and verse number, verse number three, this is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. So eternal life is a relationship with the one who has redeemed us. It is a relationship with God as our father, but with Christ as our redeemer as well. So the position of the book is relatively important. It's not just there by happenstance, uh, but it is showing us that we move from rebellion to the reign of Christ by means of redemption by Christ and as well a relationship with him. Now, 
In the Hebrew Bible, it's not found in this particular location. Now, somebody can confirm this later for me, but in the Hebrew Bible, it's going to be, it's going to be right after the book of Proverbs. You ask yourself, well, that's, is that interesting or is that not interesting? Well, I, I think it's actually interesting because how does Proverbs, how does the book of Proverbs end? Proverbs 31 ends speaking about a virtuous woman, if you will recall. And when we come to the book of Ruth, what do we find? We find a virtuous woman. And Boaz realized, recognized, perhaps is a better word, he recognized that she was indeed a virtuous woman. And so in the Hebrew Bible, it is placed after the book of Proverbs, because who, I'm not going to say she's the only one, but who better, uh, who is a better example of a virtuous woman than, than Ruth? A woman who loved her mother-in-law, who followed her mother-in-law, who cared for her mother-in-law. And uh, I'm not going on about mothers, mothers-in-law tonight at all, but uh, that's what she did. She was a virtuous woman. She was a hardworking woman. She is a woman that we find in Proverbs chapter 31. The next point that I want to make, and we are coming towards the end, I might, I might actually be shorter than I'm allowed to be tonight, possibly, possibly not. Um, I just want to think about the preaching of the gospel. I just want to look at one little point. There's lots that we can get when we want to preach the gospel from the book of Ruth. Um, we can talk about the, the kinsman redeemer and how, how that is the person of the Lord Jesus, and, and that is all very good. But I just want to think about this, about two key words that we find in Ephesians chapter number two and verse number eight. So if you're preaching the gospel sometime, you can think about the book of Ruth and think about two key words that we find in Ephesians two, verse number eight, where Paul writes these words, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So the two words that I want to think about just for one moment is this, grace and faith, grace and faith. Now, where do we find grace in this particular book of Ruth? We find it in Boaz. Boaz was providing more than what he needed to do. Now, I know there were some obligations under the law, and people could, people could uh, reap from the corners when the, uh, if they were a poor person, if they were a stranger, they could go to the corners, and where things had fallen, they could pick that up and take it home and enjoy it. But he's saying here, you know, leave, some, leave some handfuls on purpose for her. And, and time after time, he is loading her up with blessings. So what do we find? We find abundant grace in Boaz. So when we think about the message of the gospel, we find abundant grace in the person of Christ, the one who provides not just the minimum, but provides us with all that we need, uh, all these spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. Grace provided by Boaz, grace provided by Christ. But the other key word is faith. And so what we find uh, as far as faith is concerned, we see, we see Ruth and she places her confidence in Boaz. She understands. She goes to him and says, spread, um, spread your coat, spread your thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. She, she understands this is the only man that she knew of. This is the only man that can actually rescue me, that can actually redeem me. And he, and he was. We get that in chapter number four. He was the only one that was able and willing to redeem her. So we find her faith, her confidence being placed in the only one that could save her, the only one that could help her. So we find grace and faith. Now, there are other words in Ephesians 2 and chapter number 8. Uh, it is the gift of God. Obviously, we find gifts here in this particular book as well. Point number, you won't believe this, but we're at point number 11. So we're moving towards the end. Point number 11. What are the purposes of this book? Why did, why, did, why did somebody pick up their pen and write this book? Well, you'll say it's because God inspired them. And I will say you're absolutely right. We have the inspired word of God in our hands tonight or on our laps or on our desk or whatever it might be. But why did God inspire? Why did God put these words into the mouth of somebody, into the pen of somebody, if you wish? Well, there are four G's that I'm going to give you, four purposes that start with G. And one I've already mentioned. But here it goes one more time, the grace of God. Where, where do we find the grace of God? We find the grace of God in bringing a Moabite woman into the, the lineage of Israel. A Moabite woman. The Moabites were enemies of the people of God. They hadn't treated them well. And you can read all the stories about what happened in Moab. Uh, you can read about where they came from. I'm not going to get into that tonight at all, at all. 
but we find the grace of God in bringing a Moabite woman into a place of blessing within the nation of Israel. Number two, we find here in this book something about the government of God, the government of God, because God allowed Elimelech to take his family down to Moab. And there God taught a lesson to Elimelech as well as to his family. Now, I'm not saying that God is a hard God because he is not. He is a loving God. But God sometimes in his government, in his discipline, will teach us things that we could not learn otherwise. It, it is always with the point of bringing us back to him, always with that purpose, to bring us back to him. And that is what happens here. We've looked at this at this book and said that return is a common word. It's over and over and over again. We find it in chapter number one. So we find the government of God, all, all that Moab provided for them was sadness and sorrow and separation. What did, what did she have to leave behind when she actually left Moab? All that she left behind were tombs. That's all she had to leave behind, just three tombs, nothing else. It hadn't provided her with what she wanted. So sometimes, as believers, we can go looking for things to satisfy our longings, our needs, in places that God doesn't want us to search. And we will find that they will leave us empty, and they will leave us dry, and they will leave us sad, and there will be a time perhaps of separation. I'm not saying that God forsakes us, but we turn our back upon him. So we have the grace of God, purpose one, the government of God, purpose number two, the goodness of God. And we've kind of mentioned that with the word hesed, and somebody can correct me on my, trans, on my, on my pronunciation, I've mentioned that already, but we see it over and over and over again, the goodness of God. But think about this, the goodness of God is actually seen in his people. So they are the ones that are showing the goodness of God. Uh, Ruth does it towards her mother-in-law, for example. Boaz does it towards Ruth as well as towards Naomi. And we see it in other cases too. But the goodness of God is seen throughout this whole book. But the other thing that I notice is this. When you come to 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, what you're not going to find is what we need for a king. What we need for a king is a genealogy. Right? And so there's no genealogy of David mentioned in Samuel's books. But here in Ruth chapter number four, we have the genealogy of David. So this book is written in part, it's inserted here in part to give us the genealogy of David that we have read together already. Point number 12 is a practical book. And again, I'll just mention three or four things here. If we wanna learn how to make choices or decisions in life, I, I think that we can look at a couple of choices that were made in chapter number one that were made one outside the fear of God and the other in the fear of God. Elimelech, I think perhaps outside the fear of God, it was a, a wrong choice, a wrong decision. Ruth made the right decision based upon her fear of God. So we learned something about choices in this book. We learned something about the confidence that we can have in God, the trust that we can have in God. And again, you can look at different examples as you go through it. But even the fact that even the fact that uh, Naomi is willing to pack up her whatever she happened to have and move back because she had heard that there was bread now in the house of bread in Bethlehem, that would tell us that she had some confidence in her God. And that confidence was almost contagious because as we read what are perhaps one of the most famous words of, uh, of the whole book, when Ruth says, entreat me not to leave thee, to return from following after thee, whether thou goest, I will go. And you know the rest of it. We often hear it at weddings and that type of thing. Well, she is showing her confidence in God as well. The other thing that we find is this. There's, it's a book of commitment, a commitment to biblical principles that Boaz is showing he can leave the corners, but even go far beyond what biblical principles demand. The commitment that we find of Ruth towards her mother-in-law, Naomi. And there are other commitments that we find too. The other story that we find here is the conversion of a Gentile and the cultivation, if I can use that word, of godly character in Ruth. So we see Ruth growing in her, I can't use the word Christian walk, but growing in her godly walk. And we find that as we go through the book as well. Point number 13. I know you're all getting tired, but point number 13. Here we have the word purity, okay? Because we find bows, and it says in chapter number two, uh, he was a mighty man of wealth. 
So he's a wealthy man, he was a powerful man, but he was a pure man. Now in the world in which we live, and we know that we have gone through a, a period of time of the Me Too movement, I'm not saying it's all over, but the Me Too movement that started some time ago, wealthy, powerful men, that when they were around a virtuous woman like Ruth, they did not behave in a virtuous way. But here we have a man who was mighty. He was a mighty man of wealth, but he was a virtuous. He was a man of purity as well. And he treats not only his servants with respect, uh, but he treats Ruth with complete purity as well. My last point. And somebody says, amen. Um, my last point tonight is the word picture. Because this book, and I've mentioned this already, Boaz is a beautiful picture of Christ, our kinsman redeemer. The word, the word in Hebrew is G-O-E-L, I think. Um, but Boaz is a beautiful picture of Christ. And as you read through the book for your on your own time, again, just think about how Boaz shows us something about Christ. No, no picture of Christ is perfect, obviously. Uh, but here we have something that shows us the wonderful character of Christ, his compassion towards us. So I'll leave you with these thoughts. Ruth in chapter number one is solitary. She's left alone. Her husband is gone. Ruth in chapter number two is serving. She's working in the field. Ruth in chapter number three is submitting. Her mother-in-law tells her what to do and she submits. Beautiful example. And in chapter number four, now if you're a mother-in-law tonight, I'm not saying you need to boss around your daughter-in-law. That's that not the idea. Once once they're married, they're off on their own and they make their own decisions. That, it, it, it's, that's the right way to do it. However, if a mother-in-law has an opinion to express from time to time, that's fine. But the, the man of the house is the man of the house. Here, there was no man of the house. Okay, so there's a different, different story. Just be very careful there. So chapter number four, uh, Ruth is solitary. She's serving. She's submitting. Ruth in chapter number four, what is she? One more S. I'd almost like to make it into a Bible class like for the children, but Ruth is satisfied, isn't she? Completely satisfied in chapter number four. So with that, I'll, I'll leave it and I'll turn the mic back over to uh, whoever takes control of the mic. And it's been great being with you all.